That was Thank you. Good evening. My name is Krista Bailey. I am I'm the director of the Center for Sustainable Future here at IU South Bend. And I'm going to ask a whole array of people to join us on campus this semester. Um, we meant to start last week. I don't know if you noticed, but most of us were holed up at home in the cold and the ice as things were closed. Um, so if you were keeping an eye on our schedule, uh, or if you haven't yet, there are materials out at the front table. They'll be there afterwards as well, outlining the event. We are going to reschedule that first one for later in the spring, so it will happen. I know, it's so exciting. Sewers. <laughs> you don't want to miss it. Um, so that is coming up later on um, in the spring. So we're going to jump right to number two. Uh, so here's that. Uh, so a few uh, logistics before we get started, we have a, which you'll find a surprisingly interesting, delightful, innovative set of messages from our speakers tonight. Um, but before we get to that, um, we are live streaming the talk, so if, and we will be doing that with all of them. We're also recording it as we go, so we'll be putting these up on our YouTube channel later, so you can share this with somebody later. Um, and you can go back and, and watch it later. Those of you that are watching the live stream, please make sure your mic is muted. We love your kids, um, but we don't need to hear them in the talk. Uh, and if you have questions, um, if you're dialing in from, out, um, from outside of campus, there's a chat button and you can type your questions and I'm happy to ask them on your behalf. Uh, so there's that. Um, or if you unmute your mic, you will hear your voice coming from above. So we'll all be prepared for that if that happens. Um, so why do we have a sustainability innovation series here? Well, in part, um, it's part of our academic program. So we are the Indiana University campus with a major and a minor and a graduate certificate in graduate <coughs> sustainability studies. Uh, so we offer that here exclusively, which is very exciting. There's also materials about this out on the front table, um, but pictures of of beautiful people who happen to be graduates from our program who got jobs because of their degrees in sustainability. It works. Uh, so there's that. So if you'd like to learn more about yourself or for someone you know um, how to study sustainability, what you can do with it, feel free to pick these up, um, take them with you. Or, you know, take a picture and look us up online. There's that too. Um, I I guess before we get to the heart of the talk, I know you want to get to know them and what they have to say, um, but we're all here together to learn together um, and to help build and expand our sustainability community here. So here's your chance um, before you are sitting in your seats for a while, listening and taking notes and ready to ask questions to the other people that are here in the audience. Um, so we ask that you stand up, look around, find someone you don't know. I know, I see you too. Oh, geez. Um, Share your name. What brought you here? What are you excited to hear about and learn about? Um, so connect with someone you don't know. Um, you could cross the room or just turn to the person closest to you if you don't know. So let's take a few minutes um, to get to know one another. And then we'll get started. Okay. Hi. 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 Okay, so I have some 
Um, and thank you for inviting us in and listening to us. Um, the timing of this couldn't have been more perfect, honestly. Um, I don't know if you've seen, but we've made at NIPSCO a couple of uh, pretty big announcements uh, for us that it is uh, garnering a fair amount of attention, um, not only in Indiana, but across the nation. Um, and so this is kind of our first run at uh, rolling some of this out. Uh, so uh, please ask lots of questions. Um, I know we've got a QA and a session, but if you got a running question, uh, just, just ask. Okay, so um, first I thought I'd get a little bit of profile of a uh, nice source and then NIPSCO. So nice source is a holding company and NIPSCO is one of our subsidiaries and NIPSCO operates exclusively in Indiana, but nice source is bigger than that. We, we operate providing energy services across uh, seven states, um, being removed here so you can see kind of the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic states. Um, primarily natural gas distribution. So we, we take natural gas from a pipeline and bring it up to the customer's home. Uh, we also have an electric company and if that operates, and the only electric company that Nice Source operates is exclusively uh, in Indiana. So those other states are all about natural gas. Uh, Indiana is a combination of natural gas and electric utility. So drilling down a little bit, um, we're local here, uh, NIPSCO. Uh, we're both electric and gas service uh, in the northern third of the state. Um, the green is the electric gas system, and uh, blue is uh, the natural gas system that we uh, provide energy to our customers. All right, so let me jump right into sustainability. This is a little bit of our, our plug. Sustainability, as I think you all know, is huge word, uh, means something different to just about virtually everyone I talk to. And I'm so excited that I'm seeing these sustainability programs rise up in universities. Um, when I started out, I kind of had to create my own uh, through other departments in the past, and, and Chris and I were talking about that earlier. So um, you see this, these types of programs and degrees um, across the nation now which is um, so exciting for me because um, it's such an important topic, it's such a big topic, um, that a whole new generation of experts are being trained in universities. So selfishly, being able to hire people coming out of school with uh, these skills and talents um, is, is just super exciting uh, from my perspective. So glad to see that. Uh, at NYSource, uh, you know, we've been at it over a decade now, um, really building the program um, from the ground up. And when we started, there wasn't a lot of um, foundational work. And even to this day, there's still a lot of discussion about what is sustainability. So we've spent a lot of time kind of winding our way, figuring out what it means for our company and uh, building programs. This is a little bit of a brag slide, but um, we've got now the rise in the interest in the sustainability arena. We get rated and ranked by so many different organizations um, that are coming in and looking and assessing what we're doing and comparing us and benchmarking us um, to other utilities. Um, I feel like we had a good head start. A lot of companies are doing absolutely excellent things in this area. Um, but with our head start, I, we, we score pretty well um, across the board. And I put this up, this one uh, in, in particular is raiders and rankers that have a pretty tight tie into um, the financial arena. So these are folks that are informing investors um, on companies across the US. So I, I bring this up because sustainability is now uh, becoming very much top of mind uh, among financial advisors and financial investors. Um, proud to say we fare very well. We, we rank across the board in the, the top quartile. We're, the, really the benchmark for us, the, the highest standards of Dow Jones, sustainability index, and 
I'm proud to say that we're one of just a handful of facilities that are actually listed on the index. Um, but there's a lot of different raiders and rankers that are providing this information. So we're still figuring out sustainability too for us, still figuring out which direction to go, and actually working and dialoguing with these folks and others, um, we're helping to mold and shape really what matters most in, in the sustainability arena. And it's it's about long term. Um, it really is. And, and there's a lot of different views of that, but um, it's starting to just take shape. There's still a lot of work to do. And um, folks coming out of the university now they have a profound impact in, in shaping our future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the, the other Kelly. There's so much to talk about. We, we wanted to focus in on two areas. Um, and I encourage you, if you want to see the breadth of what we're doing, um, you can go to our website, you can call me, call Kelly, and we're glad to um, talk about any topic that, uh, that's out there in the sustainability area. But for tonight, we've got two, two areas, energy efficiency, and then I'm going to come back and talk about um, our transition away from coal to renewable energy, uh, what we're calling your energy your future. So with that, we'll turn it over to Kelly. Thanks. And like I was introduced earlier, I'm the commercial industrial account manager for this area. So I deal with the major accounts and the larger uh, commercial and industrial customers. And one of my main focuses is energy efficiency and energy profile for these companies, knowing what they're using each kilowatt, each term that they're using, and trying to be more sustainable in their business. In fact, of we're looking at cost. Cost is really huge for customers. What are they paying for? So when I thought of sustainability and presenting to you tonight, um, you have the three P's, you have the three E's. It's all it's the triple bottom line. So the strategy for us, we always focus on the people as our customers. Without our customers being successful, we're not successful. And I meet with customers and I look at what they're paying for and I look at their energy profile and I put them in the right rate structure and I can see savings just from doing that. So sometimes those customers will ask me, well, why are you coming to me and telling me I can save money because you want to make money for me? But if our customers are not successful, then we're not going to be successful. And so that's part of our strategy in building and reaching out to our customers and making sure that we know what they're using um, and we know they're on the best rate, and then we also look for ways to reduce their consumption altogether because the greenest, the greenest lot is one that we don't produce. Um, and then how that comes all together with our strategy, incorporating our customers, knowing what they're paying for and their dollars and costs, and our planet is just part of our strategy and a component of what we're looking to do. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what programs we have available. Uh, so our presidential programs, um, we have energy rebates for your HVAC uh, systems, heating and cooling. So uh, if you're 95% efficient or greater on your furnace, you can get a rebate from us. If you're 90% or greater efficient on the boiler, you can get a rebate from us. So this is what um, drives those rebate dollars. Those uh, furnaces and more efficient equipment are saving on the kilowatts the thermos being used. Um, same thing for AC units. Um, so we had a good participation. I put up the results up there for 2018. You can read them. <laughs> but uh, for lighting as well, obviously it's one of the easier things to look at, kind of low-hanging fruit. Over 1.29 million bulbs were purchased. Um, the lighting program, you get a discount at your retail store. Uh, ADP has similar program locally here for you. So if you go to Home Depot Lowe's, you'll see LED bulbs already discounted by the utility company. So that's a really successful um, bang for your buck type program. Our home energy assessments that we have available, you can see there's only 840 home energy assessments performed. Uh, we'd like to see more participation in this realm. It is basically having a professional come and walk through your house and look at um, ways to improve. 
and, and efficiency. So it could be a number of items from pipe wrapping to programmable thermostat um, and just your installation value as well. But uh, those participation that are by appointment only, so you need to call ahead and try to schedule that appointment. And there's a certain amount of dollars allocated to that fund too. So the sooner you do it, the better uh, chances are to get that participation. Uh, and our appliance recycling as well for commercial, uh, excuse me, residential customers. Instead of calling the trash guy to pick up your ferment, excuse me, your freezer that is working, we will actually give you a $50 rebate for us to come and recycle that uh, for you to make sure it's environmentally recycled. Uh, more programs for residential. Uh, these are a little bit more geared towards behavioral. Um, so we have uh, energy efficiency education program for teachers in schools. Uh, teachers who need to sign up to acquire basically this coursework um, where it teaches the students tips and then also gives them a kit so they can apply those tips and kits and take it home. Um, so really trying to get start early and get the students to apply these energy efficiency values at home. We also have a home energy report. Again, this is more towards behavioral approach. Um, and that is by invitation only. We actually uh, send that ask for our higher users of residential customers to participate in this. And basically gives them a baseline of where they're at in their energy consumption and compare it to their neighbors so they can look at ways to improve. And then we have uh, income qualified weatherization. So for low income folks, um, we can come in at no cost to them and do pretty basic things, but um, it adds a lot of value to their home and their energy bills. Going into my world a little bit, commercial industrial, um, I, every time I get an opportunity when I meet with my customers, I always tap these programs because you always want to get them early. Um, our prescriptive programs are just that it's a list and you don't need pre-approval. Um, so those are pretty easy, good participation levels there. Uh, I kind of skimmed over 5,000 projects completed, $19.5 million in incentives were paid out in 2018. Uh, that's a lot of money and that's a lot of energy saved. So really proud of that. Uh, 211 million kilowatt hours saved and 3.2 million therms saved through customers participating. So when you have commercial industrial customers, you have hundreds square foot of space. There's so many more opportunities to really reduce their energy usage if they uh, participate in these programs and really think about where they can make improvements in their um, processes. So highlighting some of these projects, LED lighting is, again, kind of, the, one of the easier things to do, but when you think of LED lighting, um, you think of kind of offices. It's just not offices. Warehousing is really important. Uh, you don't have to change those uh, T12 fluorescent bulb lights nearly as often. So there's a lot of value with just the energy bills. It's also the maintenance thereof, too. So there's a lot of benefits. Um, that's always one of our most popular projects. VFD, variable frequency drives on motors. Um, it helps reduce the initial torque when motors start turning. So um, that helps with your demand. And then uh, compressed air systems, they have to be sized correctly, um, no leaks in the system. There's a lot of opportunities with uh, compressed air as well. So I was, how do you participate? Please go to nipsco.com forward slash save energy. That's where you're gonna find all the information Call, call us, contact me, I'll get you to the right folks, and we hope you start participating. Back to Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so we'll transition to the second topic I'd like to cover tonight, um, the your, your energy, your future. So um, I'll start with a little bit of background in terms of how we got here, and then I'm just going to fly through these slides quick, because I really would like to get into the Q&A um, and happy to answer any questions you might have. So, the electric utility industry is, through, is beginning uh, an incredible transformation. Um, we're just at the start of it. Um, and so, 
all of last year, during last year at NIPSCO, uh, we took a very, very deep look into uh, our electric generation portfolio and uh, where for the long term, for the future, where we should take that electric generation uh, portfolio. So um, we went through what's called an integrated resource planning process, which is a formal process um, in the state of Indiana that all utilities go through um, to do a really deep analysis of uh, where we're at and where we want to go. Embedded in this process was also uh, we went out to the market um, and did a request for proposal to um, really seek firm. Uh, bids from the market to determine what is the lowest cost uh, electric generation that's out there. Uh, what's unique about that is typically when you go through this integrated resource planning process, you're doing a lot of forecasting and uh, analysis. This process embedded in the middle of it was uh, a firm look at the market to see what it could actually provide. Um, and so as we go through the, the, the uh, analysis, we're looking at uh, a lot of different variables. The utility oftentimes is a, is a balancing um, organization that has to uh, balance a lot of potentially competing or different um, interests. Um, so our criteria um, was multifold, as you can imagine, um, starting with the cost of customer. And that was our primary driver. How can we most cheaply provide electricity um, to our customers? But that also has to be done reliably. Um, so when we look at it, we, we have to assure that the, the lights are always on. That's what we call reliability. Um, environmental plays a role in that as well. Um, so the clean environment side of it. Um, and then as well as how do, if we are going to transition, how do we transition? We have uh, lots of big power plants out there. Um, and if, uh, if we're going to make any transition, how do we do that in such a way that we, we keep the lights on? So that's a high level overview. So we went through the process, um, started early in the year, went, had five stakeholder meetings, well attended, all over 100 people attended these meetings to provide an input. We had many, many one-on-one -on -one conversations with various groups in this process. And then behind the scenes, we were doing all the analysis and modeling and requests for proposals for bids um, in the marketplace to, to get a firm price for and um, then we were sharing the results as we were going through this model analysis process with our stakeholders and then getting, getting their feedback. In October then, in October we concluded that process. And what we had determined was, um, based on firm market pricing, that the most economic thing for us to do would be retire all of the coal fire generation and replace it with all renewable energy. And quite frankly, that was a bit surprising um, to us. And now as we see across Indiana and across um, the nation, a lot of people are now saying, what? This doesn't make sense. We thought you would transition from coal to natural gas and then over a 40, 50 year period, you know, we transition renewables. That's sort of the normal progression that would occur. Um, we're, we're a gas company, we're jumping over gas um, right to uh, renewables. The driver is economics, and that surprises everyone. That renewable energy is cheaper, less costly for our customers than running our existing coal fleet. Um, another um, result we found was that the sooner we retire coal, the more cost savings we can gain for our customers. Um, however, it has to be done in a very systematic way so that we always keep the lights on as we transition from coal to renewable energy. So it's a, a five to 10 year transition period that we're, we're just starting. We've got a good plan um, to balance all these factors, um, realize the cost benefit for our customers, as well as assure that we have a reliable system. It's a plan. And we started the process of implementing this plan. We've got a lot of work to do to actually get this, this done. Um, so a little bit of pie charting here. Um, 
the you see Indiana there, and again, the location of our existing power plants. And currently, we're about 71% coal fired for our electric generation. Um, that's about pretty typical in Indiana. 25% um, or so natural gas, and a sliver of renewables that uh, we have in our portfolio. What our plan lays out um, is by 2023, uh, our goal is to get to 53% renewable, um, and then primarily shrink the coal side of that from 71% down to 17%. Um, and then the next phase of this by 2028 then would be to completely exit coal fire generation and get to 65% uh, renewable energy for our customers. Every step along the way, we're creating more cost savings benefits for our customers. Um, so the affordable and reliable energy side of this. Um, by doing this, um, we're going to save our customers more than $4 billion um, over the, the long term. So there is cost up front because we have to build the renewable energy. But then on the back end of this, we're not buying coal. So our customers won't have to pay for those coal purchases. Um, it's like buying an LED line. You got to pay something up front. But over the life of that LED, um, you get ultimately cost savings. Um, we also need to do somewhat raise our electric transmission um, to assure that we can get the power from where we're at today with our plants um, to customers to the renewable energy projects to our customers. Um, and, and as well, assure that we can, in times when it's a wind, or not a windy night, that we can pull off of a broader market to, uh, to make sure we're on the same. Uh, switching quickly to the environmental side of this, so um, one of our primary metrics is decarbonization, uh, lowering our overall carbon emissions. Um, this plan will result in a 90% reduction for us in carbon emissions and has a multitude of other environmental benefits, which I think is on the next slide. Yeah, so it's a busy graph, uh, but it's across the board. As you can imagine, you go from coal to renewables, you're going to see environmental benefits from air emissions, water, uh, land, um, and then that greenhouse gas. And I'll just, there's one pull out box on this um, that I want to give you a sense of you know, how this fits in um, our 90% reduction. There's really two targets or metrics out there that we benchmark against, and that's the Paris Climate Agreement, which called for a 26 to 30, 26 to 28% reduction. And then the more aggressive target you might be familiar with is the uh, Intergo Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that released a report late last year on one and a half degree scenario. So it's the carbon reductions that would need to be made to limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. And that calls for a 45% reduction uh, by 2030. Um, so to put what we're doing in context, um, we'll be reducing by 90% by that same 2030 time period. So double even what most consider the more aggressive uh, IPCC one and a half degree um, scenario. Um, I just, just quickly throw this, this chart out. We, we, we decarbonized, we've been on a good path. So this, this shows um, historic and future carbon emissions. Uh, at NEPSCO, and so up to today, um, we've done a lot to decarbonize. Um, but as you can see then, as you move to the right of the graph, um, that's the future projected. And uh, you see a little bit of a plateauing out, um, and then you see a steep drop. And what's, what is occurring and will occur is that that's us getting our renewables in the ground. It's that next decarbonization project. And when we get those out there deployed, and retire um, our largest coal fire generating station, you see that significant drop um, in that 2023 time period. You'll see another one um, happen out in the 2027, 2028 timeline. That's when we take the final uh, coal fire facility that we have offline. So, uh, pretty dramatic decarbonization. Okay, so October, we um, announced the plans. Uh, and immediately 
um, got very active on um, working with vendors um, that had provided uh, renewable energy bids um, as part of that request for proposal that we did over the summer. So uh, I'm pleased to announce, and this was announced Friday, um, that um, we have the first three projects under contract. These are brand new renewable energy projects in Indiana. Um, you can see them, uh, you know, kind of approximately where they're located. It's about 800 megawatts of uh, wind uh, power. And to maybe put that into context, that's about the size of the medium sized power plant. Um, we are not done. This is just the start. Um, we expect to make additional announcements on renewable energy projects um, this year. And then what we'll do is likely issue another request for proposal um, to get new bidders in, um, and then just keep working the cycle until we get to ultimately um, uh, replacement of our coal fire generation with renewable energy. <coughs> and last slide. So I wanted to put this in a little bit of context and a little bit of a disclaimer on this, this graph as well, but. In context, um, the, the amount of re renewables we're going to be deploying um, is shown in the green. That's the go alone. And you might not be able to see it, but on the, the x axis, there's each state and the amount of installed renewable capacity each state currently has. Um, the orange line is what the installed capacity of renewable energy in the end has right now. Um, and so you can see, NIPSCO alone will exceed the renewable energy in all the state of Indiana and is in about the top quartile of the nation. Um, and then if you put the, the blue line is the renewable energy in Indiana plus what NIPSCO is going to add and puts us among one of the leaders um, in the nation in terms of renewable energy. The disclaimer is this that we can't really project what the other states are going to do as they move forward. We know they're going to go up, and so these things will move around. The purpose of this graph is just to simply show you the magnitude and the work ahead of us at NEPSCO to get a large-scale renewable portfolio deployment done. Um, it's, it's not utility-scale, it's state-scale, national-scale uh, renewable energy. That's it. Was that quick enough? The prepared remarks. Oh, thank you.